Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ205. Therapy quote number 205. Acting out. Expressions of unconscious emotional conflicts or feelings in actions rather than words. The person is not consciously aware of the meaning of such acts refers especially to acting out of transference wishes and emotions. Cathexis, attachment, conscious or unconscious, of emotional feeling and significance to an idea, an object, or most commonly, a person. Displacement, a defense mechanism operating unconsciously in which emotions, ideas, or wishes are transferred from their original object to a more non-threatening, quote, acceptable substitute, often used to allay anxiety. Family therapy, treatment of more than one member of a family simultaneously in the same session. It may be supportive, directive, or interpretive. The assumption is that dysfunction in one member may be a manifestation of dysfunction in other members. Intellectualization, the utilization of reasoning as a defense against confrontation with unconscious conflicts and their stressful emotions. The neurotic process, unconscious conflicts lead to unconscious perception, which leads to the use of defense mechanisms that result in either symptoms, personality disturbance, or both. Paradoxic distortion. Inaccuracies in judgment and perception, particularly in interpersonal relations, based on the observer's need to perceive subjects and relationships in accordance with a pattern set by earlier experience. A defense against anxiety. Passive-aggressive. Aggressive behavior manifested in passive ways such as intentional inefficiency, often arises from resentment at failing to find gratification in a relationship with an individual or institution upon which the individual is over-dependent. Projection, a defense mechanism, operating unconsciously in which what is emotionally unacceptable in the self is unconsciously rejected and attributed to others. Transference, the unconscious assignment to others of feelings and attitudes that were originally associated with important figures, for example, parents, siblings, etc., in one's early life. The transference relationship follows the pattern of its prototype. The therapist utilizes this phenomenon as a therapeutic tool to help the client understand emotional problems and their origins. So the first one acting out I think is a good follow-up to yesterday's video on splitting and projective identification. So the original first unconscious conflict that's created according to theory, object relations theory, is what's called splitting. The child has memories of his mother as being satisfying and the child has memories of his mother as being unavailable or rejecting. And these images are kept apart, they're split. By the age of three, they come together to form a whole impression of the mother as being a whole object. And, that, and that's the psychological birth of the self. The person's individuation comes from there. They can have access to the real self, the part of them that's in touch with the capacities of the real self, as described in a previous video. But between birth and three years of age, if that doesn't take place, if the splitting is still there, uh, the theory is that this is now an unconscious conflict that can affect how the person as an adult can perceive his environment. Because remember, splitting deals with anxiety. The child dealt with the anxiety of his mother being frustrating by splitting off his memories of that and his feelings associated with the mother being unavailable into the unconscious. And that's the split. And then as an adult, um, the person 
So due to repetition compulsion, which its positive intention is to master the trauma, that's a trauma, having the split still there and not being able to come together. Um, now as an adult, a person has motor skills and can speak, and because of repetition compulsion, he's going to repeat that scenario. So he'll try to recreate it, to try to redo it, to master the trauma. So he'll project onto others. Um, he'll perceive in others. Um, he'll make up any reason to do so, the rejecting mother. And then the emotions related to, to the rejecting mother, he'll direct at the non-threatening substitute, which is a symbol. It doesn't heal. It doesn't heal the split because he's actually reinforcing the split. The baby dealt with the anxiety by splitting, and then, as, and then, the adult form of that is to project the image of the mother outwardly and the director feelings of anger outwardly. That's called externalization or scapegoating or displacement. But it's 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 an extension of the splitting. You see. So the baby couldn't express uh, their anger towards the baby. The person grows up. Now the person thinks, I need to express my anger towards my mother. So he'll create, he'll, in his unconscious, think someone else is his mother. I mean, the rejecting part image of his mother. And then direct, and then communicate his anger towards his mother that way. That's why it's called a neurotic process. Um, so Kirsten Wilson called for a moral revolution for everyone to look within to heal the splits. All right. And uh, one quote from two or three days ago said the therapist spent pretty much his whole time trying to heal those splits. So this we can talk about the split in terms of love and hate, right? So the love is comes from this, the image of the mother when she was rewarding and the anger when she was unavailable. There's no use in putting labels on it. It's not helpful to say good and bad. It's, it's, it's maybe a little more accurate to say love and hate. But the idea is to bring the two together so the baby can hold the two in genuine ambivalence and see the person as a whole person, see themselves as a whole person, their humanity. Uh, in, our human, in our humanness, we find our humanity. That's Ubuntu. Um, and that leads to the psychological birth. Right? And... Um, so acting out is also one of the immature infantile defense mechanisms that works in conjunction and reinforces the splitting. That is the behavioral aspect of projective identification. Remember yes, in yesterday's video, projective identification, the person wants to control the outside symbol of his mother so that he can constantly uh, have some kind of basis upon which to direct his frustration and that's the splitting inside he's keeping that split inside by acting out the split he's not talking about it he's not healing it right that's why it's called an immature infantile de defense mechanism okay so more on acting out in future videos but just for now suffice it to say that it's it's in that it's in the category of splitting, projective identification, externalization, scapegoating, displacement, uh, using projective identification to control the other, to have a to have a representation or a symbol of the rejecting mother constantly externalized so that the so that the angry feelings can go outward and that preserves the split here. So the healing doesn't take place. You're just the person's just reinforcing the split. It's a confusion of the repetition compulsion. It's the repetition compulsion gone awry. It's, it's, it's actually hurting the person more than helping it. But the original intention of the repetition compulsion is to master the trauma. And, and you can't no one can recreate their early babyhood time in the nursery. See, um, so the, that's what the mourning process is about. The mourning comes when we heal the integrated, when we heal and integrate the splits. Splitting precludes mourning. So if, you, if the person is continuing to use these infantile defense mechanisms, they're continuing to split, they don't mourn. Splitting precludes mourning. So we have to withdraw the projections 
own the feelings as belonging to the self, towards the image of the mother, and move towards integrating, synthesizing the splits. Remember the previous quote, unhappiness is a malady of the personal synthesis. So acting out, projective identification, splitting, externalization, displacement, escaping, all that's a malady of the personal synthesis. It's an acting out of this malady, and the malady is still there, right? And that's the unhappiness. Right? It may be very dramatic on the outside, and hurtful, of course, to others on the outside. Uh, so that's, that's the repetition compulsion gone awry. It's confused. The person is missing the point. Of repetition compulsion. Repetition compulsion is to feel what you didn't feel, but that's that's an inside job. That's the moral revolution. Lowell said, "Man's evolutionary task is to heal himself, to look within, to heal himself." And all of the other authors said the same thing: Masterson, Burglar, Robert Bly, Wilson, to to look within, to heal the splits, to integrate the splits, right? to find Umbantu. The goal is to find Ubuntu as described in previous videos. So that's the primary, primary unconscious conflict, the splitting. Right. And that, that's what makes us distort reality because we're, we're caught, we're crystallized. See, by the age three, it comes together. By five, it's, it's more reinforced. Right. So it takes a lot of work to, um, to, to, to create new holding interjects um, to build our knowledge to understand what's happening and that supports the process of healing right? interpretations provide narratives which help uh, circulate the energy inside to update our memories um, in, in a sense we're healing our memories although we're not changing the past we're healing the effect of how we responded to the past so we're healing our memories so that if we heal the memories we can create um, the integration of the, the love and the, the, the two sides can come together to form whole object relations. All right, the next one's cathexis. So that's uh, just basically bonding, you know, so life force is object seeking. The baby has to bond to the mother, so there's a cathexis to the mother. Anything we bond to, externally or internally, there's a cathexis. You see, remember what Fairbairn said, the more the mother is refusing, unavailable, rejecting, abusive, and so on, the more the baby connects to the negative mother, because the more the mother, the more the baby needs the mother, so the, the attachment's even stronger. So the splitting is greater. So it's harder to heal the split. There's the trauma. Right. Displacement. So we mentioned yesterday, displacement is like a, a kind of a shorthand, abbreviated term to use to describe what was described yesterday about splitting projective identification. We're displacing emotions and wishes are transferred from their original object and transferred to a non-threatening substitute. Right? It's dis displaced. We're misplacing it. We're, it's displaced. So the person's angry at um, someone harmless. Uh, it's displaced. But they're doing it because they want to, because that's what the baby did. They kept the emotions separated, um, split off. The baby couldn't feel his angry feelings towards his mother. Right. Family therapy. So one idea around this uh, was that uh, the children can intuit what the mother wants, and as well as what the father wants and make it very confused and act out in an attempt to keep the parents happy, to keep the parents together. So it looks like the, the child is troubled and acting out and causing trouble, but he's doing it because he wants to keep his family together. So in family therapy, the therapist looks at the parents. If he can heal the parents, the child will calm down. So it's like a system there. So in the family therapy, all members are looked at. Right? It's not See, the child is just a, it's a manifestation of the problem with the parents. So heal the parents and the child will calm down, kind of thing. Intellectualization. So, so this is just using all these ideas and thoughts and reasoning and logic. 
But the motive really is to keep that split, to not want to face the split and the feelings related to the split. With rationalization, there it's a more active attempt, more active attempt to deceive the self and to deceive others to, to engage in the splitting. So rationalization is a more intense, active version uh, of intellectualization. Intellectualization is just thinking and so to squelch, his, to not get in touch with his feelings. Rationalization, he's eager to externalize his feelings and act out his feelings. So a little, little distinction there. Neurotic process. I thought that was a very succinct way of describing the neurotic process. Unconscious conflicts lead to unconscious perception. That, that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? Unconscious conflicts, the main one being the splitting, leads to unconscious perception. And then they use rationalization to justify that unconscious perception because the need is from the template, from the unconscious, from the splits. Right? Parataxic distortion is a refreshing new term um, which also describes projection and transference. Because projection and transference are so often used, projection being the general term, so remember in projection, something you don't know about yourself, you attribute it to someone else, and it becomes like a mirror. That's called the mirror defense. And, um, and in transference, that's specific with the therapist, and uh, the therapist sees what's being projected, what's being projected, and he can use that as knowledge to form his interpretation. So an alternative to projection in terms of terminology is parataxic distortion. Parataxic distortion, inaccuracies in judgment and perception, particularly in interpersonal relations, based on the observer's need to perceive subjects and relationships in accordance with a pattern set by earlier experience, a defense against anxiety. So again, it's just like an it's like projection 2.0, or it's just another way of describing projection. It's just a, maybe it has a more intellectual sound to it, so maybe there's more. It's more appealing. Maybe sometimes we use parataxic distortion to maybe take away some of the loaded emotions related to the terms projection and transference. Maybe we need this less emotionally loaded term to face projection and transference. So we'll use parataxic distortion. Okay, the next one's passive aggressive. Aggressive behavior manifested in passive ways, such as intentional inefficiency. So maybe if the secretary is unhappy with her boss, she might purposely misplace the file or cause problems or something. So she's angry, she's annoyed, and she's expressing it in these kind of passive, quiet ways. Uh, it'll make the other person annoyed, and then she feels uh, that's her attempt to communicate her anger by making the other person angry, maybe unconscious, you know. The common example is uh, the wife adding too much salt to her, to the meal, knowing that the husband doesn't want doesn't like salt, but she does it to get to make him angry. And she's trying to communicate that she's angry, so she's making him angry. Um, yeah, there's another quote that said that the, the, the woman couldn't find any satisfaction in the relationship. So, uh, so she settled for the closest thing, she could, the next, to make him angry, and she, she got an emotional response from him, so she felt some vicarious relating because he's expressing her anger so she's trying to create some relating that way you know very dysfunctional of course okay and projection um, he, this definition says the person rejects what they don't want to feel and then attributes it to others so And again, mo most often it's mope being projection. Usually there is some truth to what you're saying about the other person, but it's so minuscule, it's not really the issue. 
it's, it's just, uh, they call it projection hook. You're just using that as an excuse to talk about yourself, but you don't want to be aware of it within yourself. That's the mirror projection. And then again with the transference, same idea. Uh, there was a prototype set in childhood. The person reenacts it with the therapist. The therapist sees it in action and offers an interpretation. You know, you know a lot of this stuff um, reminds me of Rosenberg. Uh, his I statement, he, he created this whole self-help uh, network or organization for the sole purpose of doing one thing, just one thing. He spent his whole life touring the world, giving endless lectures and seminars and workshops just to teach people one thing, how to make an I statement. And if you can make an I statement, You'll, you'll become more aware of how you're being passive aggressive, your parataxic distortions, you know, creating an identity for someone to meet your psychological need to, to get rid of your anxiety, your, your, your transference, the repetition compulsion. Um, this whole neurotic process, what you're displacing, scapegoating is acting out. He thinks, you know, if you just learn how to make I statements, just make an I statement, a lot of this can, then you can reconfect to yourself. And, and help heal the, the splitting. So his I, his version of the I statement he calls OFNR, an acronym O F N R, observation, feeling, need, request. So, um, for example, briefly, uh, two friends agreed to meet at three o'clock. Um, one arrives on time. The other one arrives, say, at three thirty. Um, the person who had been kept waiting, uh, maybe was triggered by this because the friend arrived late and didn't say anything about it. And the friend might make an observation, say, it's th it's 3.30, you arrived, at, we agreed to meet at 3, it's 3.30, it's, uh, I didn't, there's no, acknowledge, no message from you, no acknowledgement about the time gap. Um, so it's just a, like an observation. You're just trying to keep it without pointing the finger or blaming. So, uh, but but the truth is that's the trigger for the person. Then, because of the trigger, he's time traveled back in the past. So what happened in the past? What is this in resemblance of in the past? Okay, it could be that as a child, the mother wasn't around. So what need would a child need? if he needs the mother and the mother's not around. So the child might need reassurance of the connection, safety. Okay, then you uh, fast forward to the present and you might share that in your I statement. It's 3.30, it's, uh, it's uh, I agree to meet at 3, three o'clock. I feel un uncomfortable because I have a need child you as a child had the need the child had the need for connection and safety and he may make reference to that because I had I had a need either he can talk about it as a as a parataxic distortion as a projection from the past to the present or he can just say it in the present you know I, I have a need for uh, connection and safety and, uh, and the, the person who was late whoa yeah I didn't realize that was quite a trigger I'm s sorry or something you know? or um, so the, the theory is if the person can make an I statement he, he's expressing what's alive in him what's real in him the friend can understand him better um, you know sometimes the friend is uh, triggered by this oh you're so sensitive <laughs> so now the friend jumped into a judgment. Um, so now the the first person can say, um, can you make an I statement? What's going on for you? He says, well, when I heard all this, what you just said, uh, I felt annoyed because it reminded me of when I was a child, when I expressed emotion, uh, I was criticized. 
And I need and what I needed at that time was to be myself, to have my to know who I am and to, to have the autonomy to be myself and to express myself. And I didn't get that. So that got squelched. So that's what I needed. I see. And back and forth. See if the two people are making I statements like that, um, they can become aware of their projections. They can become aware of their parataxic distortion, um, and uh, and ult and ultimately, the more we get in touch with some of this, and if we feel safe with the other person, grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. Then we can uh, discharge some of the anger towards the parents, uh, and then maybe start to be able to see the parents as regular people caught in their existential dilemma. The parents may have had prenatal trauma, birth trauma, situational trauma, intergenerational trauma, trauma with siblings and family member, trauma, school shock, trauma at the dentist, trauma with their get, while getting their tonsils out. Tonsils out and other, so the parents are caught in their existential dilemma. So when we get in touch with our angry feelings towards our parents, it can help lead to uh, the Ubuntu towards our parents, which leads to Ubuntu to, for ourselves, and we're healing the splits. So maybe Rosenberg's model of the I statements is not so bad um, if, if it can help a person become aware of their projections and so on. Okay, I think I'll just uh, leave it here. So this has been TQ205 uh, with a brief uh, reference to the work of uh, Rosenberg. His book is called A Language of Life, How to Make an I Statement, Offner, Observation, that's the trigger, the feeling and need, what happened in childhood, what need did the child need, see if the child didn't get his need met then he's feeling hurt, and then to, uh, then to maybe uh, test the waters with a friend. You can ask a friend how are you hearing? How are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you okay with what I'm saying? Let's just make sure the relationship is still going on. You know. But I think, uh, on more practical terms, personally, I think in, in a more practical sense, awareness of awareness of these defense mechanisms has an immediate, more immediate, uh, uh, practical way to acknowledge how we're dealing with our feelings, you know. Yeah. Okay, I'll just leave it here. Thank you very much. This has been TQ205. More next time. Bye for now.